Hi, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Richard Brown and a uh, very, very good friend, a business partner of mine, Damien Fogg, on the phone. So let's just make sure you're there, Damien, before we go too much further. I am here. Every so often when you say that, I always want to just stay in complete silence to keep you guessing. But yeah, I'm here today. I'm pretty sure you have done at least once. <clears throat> but there we go. <laughs> that is the way we are. <laughs> it was certainly the way you are anyway. <laughs> yes. But anyway, before people wonder what on earth they're doing, yes, you're in the right place if you wanted to talk about uh, finding property deals. Uh, find 7% 7, 7 to 15% return on investment property deals every single week, in fact. That's what we're going to talk to you about today in our how-to training. We're going to talk about our three-step real-world property system. And it is a real-world property system because we use it every single day. And we're actually going to show you some of the, some of the snippets of that. We're going to go into a live deal and share all that with you. And so the headlines really are, we're going to talk about how to find the hidden treasure. The hidden treasure is those deals, those deals with that great uh, return on investment, that profit potential. Where can you find them? Second thing is really how to add value to property to make a profit and uh, grow the equity. We're not talking about capital growth here. That happens naturally over time. If you're lucky, we're talking about you know, making it happen so that you're actively growing the property, uh, growing the property value and therefore the profit. And then we're going to walk you through, and in fact, Damien's uh, probably going to take the line share of this bit, how, to, how we desktop evaluate a deal. And we're saying 30 minutes or less, uh, we've got it down now to a fine art. We can evaluate an opportunity in a very short period of time. So there you go. That's hopefully what we're going to be covering today. So if we can just flip on to the next, uh, next slide. So what are we going to cover in terms of our agenda? Well, what and why? Why on earth have we come up with this today? Why is it important? You know, what are we going to be talking about? Then we talk about really what's in it for you. What can you hope to achieve by following this, this system? A little bit about us and who are we to really be telling you about, uh, about the system that we operate. Then we're going to dive into some detail, the, the main core of the training, which is our, three, our simple three-step property sourcing system that's going to help you find at least one property deal of between 7 and 15% return on investment every single week, week even. So we'll talk about the treasure map. Uh, where to find them. We'll talk about forcing the appreciation, or in other words, how to add value, and whether it's deal or no deal. So that's the evaluation phase, and how you decide what to do. And I guess the outcome of the training today is um, it's going to help you follow a simple, proven system that will help you source profitable, profitable rather, <laughs> property projects to both flip or trade, uh, buy to let, or buy, refurbish, and refinance as you so wish. So they're the core aspects. And if you got to the end of the training and that's what you uh, you understand and what to do next, then we've achieved our objective. But I think, you know, Damien, you started essentially before me in terms of looking at the system that we now look at. So why don't you pick up the reins a little bit now and just talk us a little bit about, you know, how you got to that point. Okay, cool. Um, we are gonna go into a little bit more detail about our backgrounds, but just, very sort of headline stuff. When I first started off in property, all I was doing was buying property and then holding them for the long term and renting them out. And that was kind of my strategy. That was my plan. That was what I wanted to do. Very quickly, though, I hit the big hurdle that most people in property hit at some point, um, which was running out of money. So on the back of that, I thought, well, I still want to carry on going. I still want to grow my portfolio, but I need a quicker way of doing it. So the obvious way that that came about to me was do projects. Uh, it kind of makes sense. There were lots of TV shows about it at the time, so there was, everything was screaming towards do projects. But actually, what you do need is projects that stack up. Now, I've been doing this for a while, over a decade easily, and I've viewed tens of thousands of properties, sort of on Rightmove, Zoopla, all the different property portals, and I've gone through them, done my due diligence on them. But the actual number of properties I've bought, done up, refinanced, or bought, done up, and sold on, so actually that I've been involved in, only hundreds. So from a success rate perspective, I'm only shooting about 1%, 2% from all the ones I look at to the ones I actually go ahead and buy. Now, that's not to say I don't want to buy all of them, but the ones I actually do complete on, 1% or 2%. So it's quite a time-intensive um, strategy to try and find these things. So... When me and Richard started working together, efficiency is one of our big drivers. And so we kind of thought about what are all the different ways that you can use and implement and follow that are going to make it a bit more efficient, hopefully improve that 1% to 2% hit rate for you. 
And so we, we thought about, well, you could work with a sourcer, you could maybe work with a JV partner who it's their responsibility to go find the properties and you then either do the funding and working, whatever. Go in direct to vendor, so obviously knock it on doors effectively, drop in leaflets around. You can employ people, so whether they're direct staff, contractors, whatever, or you can become super friendly with estate agents. So there's lots of different ways that you can try and improve that efficiency and sort of optimize the results that you're getting. Or there is another option, and hopefully that's what this training today is going to uh, help you out with. So I think if you want to talk about what's going to be in it for them, Richard. Yeah, indeed. we we'll just skip on to that. So uh, what is in it for you? Why are you here? In other words, well, we're going to share our three-step real-world property sourcing system. Uh, we use it on a daily basis, and uh, we, we use that to find uh, added value projects which are capable of returning between seven, and it's 15% or more uh, return on investment each and every week, in fact, each and every day in reality. And so that comprises three components. The, the first component is the treasure map. And, um, okay, treasure map, but, you know, it's basically where to find the hidden gems, where to find the hidden treasure. So, you know, some great deals exist both on and off your patch. So where can you find them? I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Then what we call forcing the appreciation, which is a bit of an industry term. And, and you've probably heard about capital appreciation, uh, which is essentially how house prices go up if it's appreciation uh, over time. But forcing the appreciation is basically how you can make the value go up um, in a shorter period of time. And you do that by adding value to the property. So we're going to share with you the six ways that uh, the six top ways rather to add value to property. And then the deal or no deal is essentially how can you make a decision? What is a good deal? What is a bad deal? And uh, we'll talk you through how we can evaluate any property deal in 30 minutes or less. And I think when Damien gets on it, it might actually be maybe three minutes or less. I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. I mean, if it's not going to stack up, then yeah, three minutes. But hopefully one of them will today. That's actually a good point, isn't it? Because we can quickly dismiss the bad ones. But uh, we spend about 30 minutes or so on the decent ones. Yeah. So there we go. But if you stick around until the end of the uh, webinar today, um, we're going to show you potentially how you can find your next project for just one pound. So who are we to be telling you all about this? Well, let's just give you a bit of a bit of background there. So first of all, real world property training. That's who we are, Damien and Richard or Damien Fogg and Richard Brown to give us our full names. What we stand for is ethical, sustainable and practical education and projects for property investors. So we like to be accountable to our values. We like to operate according to our values. And indeed, that's what we do. We've been working together for a, a couple of years now. We've been working on both education, that's training, such as this. It's also projects, such as maybe an example of which we'll show you in a, a little while. So just about the company. Uh, and as far as personally is concerned, um, Damien just alluded to himself a little bit, but just a little bit about me. I won't go into all of this, but uh, you can see I've been, it's a bit of a joke about my age and fighting it. Um, but yes, um, got a, it begins with a five, not a four anymore. So that's why I'm stretching it. But married, three children, um, had a few phases to my career, both in corporate land and, and as a businessman. Um, and more latterly now as, uh, you know, I can choose what I do essentially as a result of property. So in property, I started investing in the mid 90s um, in, fun enough, trading, refurbishment, conversions, a whole array of different things over time. I'm not suggesting you do all this straight away. And, um, and, and one of the key differences, I think, between Damien and I is I started with very little money, 10K, it says on the right hand side of the screen there. I think Damien built up a portfolio and then eventually kind of thought, hmm, it must be a more efficient way of doing this. I started with very little money. I thought, I have to find a way uh, to add value to property and recycle my funds. Otherwise, I'm not going to go very far. So that's kind of been my specialism personally. And um, as you'll probably hear, I focus a lot on the metrics and some of the uh, component parts. Damien's much more into the guts of things and, and, and would the property actually be capable of adding value? So we come at things in slightly different ways, but we arrive at the same place. You might have heard about me through the Property Voice, which is my alter ego. We have got a blog, a podcast. Of course, we've got RWPT. Um, I'm, I'm the author of a book. It's an Amazon bestseller, Property Investor Toolkit, and I, I'm a regular writer for Your Property Network magazine. Your Property Network, not Your Property Network, as he's uh, suggested there. It's just a yeah, typo on the screen. We're not perfect. <laughs> 
anyway, that's enough about me. So, Damien, why don't you just tell us a bit more about you? Yeah, um, as I feel like Richard's basically done the introduction for me now. So, um, we can skip I'm, it if you like. Well, I think most people would probably prefer if I did. But for those of you who don't know me, why not? Um, I'm 30, so I'm the young, handsome one of the group. Uh, I've, again, a bit like Richard, had a bit of a different career progress and path towards property, but it's bound to be some sort of personality disorder that when I started getting into property, I wanted to make sure I knew as much as I could about it. So I trained to become a chartered building surveyor, and since then I've sort of worked in lots of different big organizations and uh, architects and building surveying firms to build up all of that in real life experience. I'm also a regulated mortgage broker because you can never have too many qualifications. Over the years, I've predominantly bought sort of starter home type properties, so you have two up, two down, uh, terraces, three bed semis, things like that. Um, I've been a property manager, I've managed 850 properties as a developer. For myself and for other people, I've developed probably, that, that's probably more like 12,000 units now, but a fair number of them anyway. And yeah, people may know me from the Buy to Let Strategy blog or from RWPT or again, another podcast, the Property Investor Podcast. So we both put ourselves around a little bit, let's say. Put ourselves around a bit. Well, <laughs> maybe you want to rephrase that, but... Um... <laughs> No, no, I'm going to leave it hanging. You're going to leave it hanging. Okay, people can form their own conclusions. In the property <laughs> context, I think I'm sure you mean. So getting it back to real world, and real world property, let's just talk a little bit about sourcing from our perspective and the system that we have, if you like. And I talked about the three steps, the first of which is the hidden treasure. So this is essentially uh, where I start effectively, um, you know, in looking at uh, looking at opportunities or, or where we start. And, and I, th I think it's all about finding the right treasure for you, for you personally. So we're talking about area. We're talking about location. And um, before we do anything, though, we just need to understand what are the what are the key components of, of ourselves, what we're looking for? Well, some of the key ingredients are our time availability, the resources we have access to, which is often financial, but not exclusively, and the level of know-how, knowledge, skills, experience, etc., that we have in the industry. Then we need to look at our strategy. Um, here with today, we're talking about whether it's flip or trading property, whether it's buy to let, or whether it's what we call buy, refurbish, and refinance. So um, they're, they're the main strategies that we'll be focusing on today. And then we need to know our key performance indicators or KPIs and some deal criteria. And we'll, we'll show you an example in a second so you can see what kind of things we mean. So you should have all, have all that in place. You should have some sort of assessment and you should know what you're looking for as a result of that. But in terms of looking at the area and the treasure map, as, as we call it, there's a few key aspects. First of all, we need to look at the mix of supply and demand in the area. So um, one of the things we always look at is the ratio of property available versus property sold. And uh, just a quick clue there, you can just do a right move or a Zoopla search. And if you just look in your area and click in including sold subject to contract or excluding sold subject to contract, you can see that mix. And the same applies for rental properties as well as sale properties. So just a bit of a clue. In terms of the fundamentals of the location, well, some of the main ones we look at are the population. So you know, this is a clue towards demand. If it's a rural area, there's probably going to be less demand for property in the area. So we're looking for, you know, things are going to prop up demand. So higher density population is one of those things. Employment factors are also important. Now, it doesn't matter if you're looking for benefit types of tenants, if you're looking for rental property, or if you're looking for working uh, types of tenants. Uh, the key is to understand what the employment characteristics are and how suitable it's going to be for your strategy. And then the third aspect is investment. And investment can come from the private sector, so how many new companies are moving in, how many jobs are being created, that kind of thing. Or it can be more public, public sector related, so things like tra transport infrastructure expenditure and those kind of uh, major projects which are going on in the area. And I guess the, the final piece of the jigsaw is to look at what we call the market temperature and uh, talk about the Goldilocks principle, uh, of course, with three bowls of porridge. Uh, in, similarly, in property markets, you can have a hot market, a cold market and a lukewarm market. We quite like lukewarm markets because it's not just not too hot and not too cold. So um, we're not necessarily being outbid on every project in a hot market or being stuck with a property we can't sell or rent out in a cold market. So we try and find this uh, this balance. So it's usually the average time on the market 
uh, if it's a, if it's a sale uh, exit we've got planned of uh, around about between 90 and 150 days that sort of magnitude would be a, a, an example of a lukewarm market so here's uh, his example it's just been uh, put in front of me um, you can see for yourself but this this which is you know an illustration of somebody who is perhaps looking for some property maybe you can identify with some of these things maybe you can't but the point is it's made personal for you so the first thing here is how much time what are your resources so in this example four or five hours a week perhaps an hour a day at most uh, to spend on property maybe this person works full-time and uh, this is a part-time aspect so they've got a hundred thousand pounds in cash to invest a uh, fairly early stage but got a little bit of experience in terms of refurbishment perhaps from a DIY project at home something like that they've chosen uh, a, a buy refurbish refinance project so they can make the money work harder for them so that hundred thousand can put it into one or two properties and then run out or alternatively recycle the funds and be able to build up a portfolio more gradually by adding value to property refinancing it and then going again in terms of their KPIs, they've set um, a, a benchmark, if you like, of 8% or more as return on investment. The ability to recycle 80% or more of their starting funds. So in this example, 80K out of 100. And then because they're going to retain the property, 150K is the minimum cash flow from the project to make it worthwhile to them. And in terms of criteria, I only touched on it briefly, but uh, they've narrowed it down to looking at two or three bed terrace houses, which are capable of refurb projects. Um, costing in the region of 80 to 120,000 pounds. Ideal location for them, therefore, is probably you know relatively easy to commute, whether it's a drive or a train, up to an hour and a half. Above average employment, because uh, the, it's, it's implicit here, they've uh, decided to rent to professionals, working tenants, and a reasonable size urban area, so the population thing we talked about. A little bit of inward investment, maybe some road building, maybe a new train station, that kind of thing. And the average time of market, as I mentioned, 150 days or less uh, with a strong rental market. So average time to rent is less than 40 days. So there, that's an example. Uh, you can flex that to suit yourself, but have it is the point. Have it uh, set so you've got your own treasure map. You know what you're looking for. And whenever you talk to anyone or when the, whenever you do a search, you have that criteria and you have something to judge your success against. And um, I think, Damien, this is probably more back to you, isn't it? I think you're very much into this how to make profit through property. So when, yeah, I think yep. when we start getting into the details of actual properties and buildings and bricks, I think that's where I'd much prefer hanging out. So there are fundamentally, if we're talking about flipping properties or adding value, whatever you want to call it, there are three main ways you can make a profit from property. So you can either make a profit when you, or when you buy the property, you can negotiate a good purchase price, I'm going to say you can buy below market value. It does happen every now and then, but it's very rare, so don't believe the hype. But you can buy well, and that's a good way to make profit. You can also, when you're owning the property, if you're doing works to it, um, you can, if you're very good at negotiating, for example, and you can get all the materials cheaper, or if you can do any of the work yourself, you can maybe not spend as much money as everybody else on the refurb side of things. And then also, when you come to sell it, you can maximize the sales price you get by maybe dressing the property really well. Maybe you really know your end market, so you can make it appeal specifically to them. So there's three different areas of how you can make a profit. And realistically, you can make a profit and a decent flip project by being good at just one of those things. So when people, everyone, everyone, a lot of people talk about, oh, you only make your biggest profit when you buy. I understand where they're coming from, but in property, it's a very competitive market. The UK is a very sophisticated market, so it's it's rare that you will get something massively below its market value nowadays. Not always the case, but rare. Um, I historically probably bought 95% of my properties through estate agents. So what other people would say is, oh, well, you're only getting the second-hand deals, the ones that the real investors didn't want because they've been schmoozing estate agents for years. That's fine. So maybe I've never really made my profit in that first step, but because I can beat up contractors and effectively get a good price for the refurb, and because I can dress it and make the property appeal to my end market, I can, in the other two, I can make up for that lack of profit from the first one. So don't get hung up on trying to find the perfect property. Just maybe focus on one of them and really try and get good at it. If you can focus on two of them, happy days. 
So that was just a brief overview of how to make a profit from those three areas. But if we're talking specifically about forcing appreciation here, I believe we've got yet the six of the top ways. There are there are lots of ways, um, and we can. I mean, we could probably come up with any number of them if we started breaking it down room by room almost. But there are six main ways of doing that. Now, hopefully you can see them all. But just quickly, we've got internal decor and curb appeal. So just making the place look nicer, making it look nice from the outside and internally. Increasing usable living space, so think about sticking an extension on, maybe a conservatory, maybe a loft conversion, something like that. You can remodel, upgrade, refurbish, so that's, it might sound like internal decor, but it's a bit more than that, so it's maybe um, fixing, replacing a kitchen, a bathroom, something like that, so it's a bit more remodeling. You might be moving walls around, you might be opening walls up, stuff like that. Fixing structural issues, now that's one that I particularly quite like because I can spot them and have a good idea of what it's likely to cost. But if you're looking at a property that's maybe got subsidence, a lot of people will be put off that. Uh, a lot of companies won't lend against properties like that. So there is the potential to buy it and make a good profit there by fixing a particular problem. Damp's another good one. Uh, fifth one is change of use and evaluation method. So that's maybe turning a, a standard um, property into maybe a HMO, something like that, commercial, something, um, where you can maybe go from a standard bricks and mortar valuation towards more of a commercial valuation. That can force appreciation. And then the final one is legal and planning gains. So effectively buying maybe a property that's got a big back garden and getting planning permission for another dwelling in the rear garden somewhere, something. So there's lots of, they're the top ways to force appreciation. My personal favorites, and I know we didn't talk about this, Richard, but I'm going to say number four and number six. What, what are yours? Oh, thanks for that. Uh, yeah, probably uh, number three and number five. Okay, cool. So unlucky number one and number two. <laughs> <laughs> but I think I'm going to just crack on now with, or are you doing this bit? You're doing this bit. This is you, desktop evaluation boy. I think it might be. So if you just want to skip through. Okay, so um, we mentioned that, you know, Damien and I come at things from, from different starting points, but we end up in the same place. Uh, I think that's important to point out. Uh, Damien very much looks at the property and comes out, and I look at the sort of macro area and come in. So when I'm looking at a, a, a deal, I've, I've kind of got some macro criteria in my head that I'm trying to understand. So here, if you remember, the sort of case we're looking at is a, is a, a buy, refurbish, refinement, uh, refinance even project. So in this particular case, uh, what I would do is I'd set up some searches on the main property portals. Of course, there's Rightmove, there's Zoopla, there's On The Market, and then there's a whole range of other ones that are out there now. But by far the biggest one is Rightmove. So let's start there. We do a Rightmove search, and we're searching for property. Uh, now, we've got some you know, standard rules. So they're more like guidelines and rules, but 95%, 80%, and 40%. We'll explain that to you now. Um, so if you assume that you can buy a property for 95% of the asking price, as Damien said, the whole below market value thing, it's, you know, it's hard to come by. But the average selling price across the country over recent years is being 95% of asking price. So it's a fairly reasonable assumption. Now, of course, if you can negotiate better than that, you know that you're going to be making more profit, but it's a reasonable assumption to make. Then for the BRR project, we're going to assume that we can uh, target, uh, sorry, recycle 80% of the uh, starting cash fund. So remember in this case, there was £100,000, so hopefully we'll get £80,000 back out again. Um, and then we just need to top up 20 to go again next time. And then the, the other sort of test or the little golden rule, if you like, is um, can we uplift the value from the purchase price by 40% or more? And we're going to do a little test to see if that's the case. And the way we test it is we're really looking for uh, between three and six. I mean, ideally, if you, the more the better. But between three and six, recent and relevant sales comps or com comparable sales values to give it its full description. And we're looking for A1 condition comparables here. So what we would turn this property into. Um, we might need to do a bit of flexing if we can't find enough, but um, or might to extend the area if we can't find enough. But the best comparables are going to be sold within the last six months, within a quarter of a mile radius, ideally on the same street. So that's the next thing. 
Then we're going to estimate the cost of works, so and that's really where Damien comes into his uh, particular forte, much more than me anyway. Uh, estimate the cost of works, the transaction, and the holding costs. Don't forget those. There are costs involved in buying property, holding property, and selling property. Then we're going to crunch the numbers uh, to test the theory, and uh, we can flex those rules in reality. Uh, one such flex, for example, and, and you know, is, is if we buy at auction, because typically if you buy at auction, you might be lucky to buy 95% of the guide price, but typically guide price is pitched low, so you end up paying above it. So just a little way in which you could flex the rules. But if you're buying off the open market, 95% of asking price is reasonable. If you buy at auction, maybe you end up paying a little bit of a premium above the guide price. And uh, if the property passes the hurdles, we move on. So as I mentioned, that's the way in which we achieve uh, 7 to 15 percent return on investment uh, property deals each and every week. So finding the treasure, making the profit and doing the desktop evaluation. And if I'm not mistaken, I think we're probably going to move into a bit of a live example, Damien, aren't we? Yes, we are. So we're going to actually look at a real life sort of live source deal now. So hopefully it'll all go according to plan, but we'll see. Um, so as Richard was just talking about, we do follow this three step sourcing process. Um, the initial element of it is the search. That's sort of looking at potentially everything and narrowing it down. And then we look in a bit more detail and actually evaluate the deals, the individual property deals in a bit more detail. And we're going to run through that now live for you. And then we make the decision on whether or not it meets the KPIs we want, um, if it's going to be a deal for us that we want to pursue or not. So it's pretty binary. We get to stay at that point, yes or no. Does it meet all the KPIs we've set for this particular project or particular client or whatever? It's a yes or no. So there's, there's not so much of the leaving it to chance, leaving it to how you feel that day. This is investment. This is a business. So we need to be fairly clear with what is a goer and what isn't. So... Without further ado, let's take a look at a real deal. Now, I'm going to start messing around with screens. So hopefully, this will work vaguely straightforwardly. So, Richard, if you can just let me know if you can see this screen. I can indeed. It's an Excel spreadsheet. Excellent. It's working. So you can see this is sort of the starting point that we use. And, I mean, what's that? 1,870. So that's how many we've evaluated relatively recently. In fact, you can see one of our staff is actually still using this document at the moment, so I'll try not to change anything on them. Um, but this is just headline stuff. We've given them some criteria to go and search for. It comes into this stage, so it's been pre-vetted to an extent, but not hugely. Now, because I knew this webinar was coming up, here's one we've done earlier. So we've actually selected one from here, and if the screen has changed now, Richard, you're basically going to be my screen-changing help here. Indeed, the screen has changed to show a nice picture of a semi-detached property. Excellent. So this was found by one of our staff that sort of went through the pre-vetting process and has provided this and said, basically thrown this in front of us and said, this looks like it could be a deal. What do you think? And so we now go on to the next stage of the process. Damien, um, can I just do one quick sec? Sorry, just, just so people know what, what that first stage is. It, it's essentially searching the portals against our preset criteria. OK, so that spreadsheet that you shared are the results of that search, which, you know, they're properties that meet our preset criteria. And obviously you pick one to have a look at here, so just so that's clear. Probably a good clarification there. Thank you. OK. Um, so, yeah, as, as Richard said, this is one that's come out of all of that search. So we will create a separate spreadsheet now that we'll start going through working line by line. But I guess. Richard, I'm sure we'll jump in at some point. As, as we said earlier, we look at properties from sort of two different angles. I look specifically at the property first and then move out. Richard tends to do it the opposite way around and look out at the area and then move back into the specific property. So first thing I would do when I saw this is basically flip through the pictures. So it looks fairly bog standard, three bed semi, nothing overly exciting, but equally nothing to be overly concerned about. And I just start flicking through the pictures and think, OK, why has this been flagged as meeting our criteria? So it's clearly had a lot of pictures on the wall at some point, but it's clearly old, dated, needs a bit of work, it needs tidying up. The windows, you can see here, the windows, they look relatively new. They look double glazed, so I don't think potentially, 
at this point, I'm building up what do I think needs to be done to the property, what are the costs that are likely to be incurred, but it's just a very general over, a f overview or a feel for what type of stuff needs to be done. The fact it's got radiators tells me there is central heating in the place. Kitchen is lovely. Um, that's obviously all going to need ripping out and changing, but again, windows, relatively new and clean, probably going to keep them. That's a treat. Um, yeah, so you can kind of get a feel for it. I'm sure a lot of people uh, watching this now have seen properties very similar to this. It's probably not been decorated or touched for quite a few years. They'll have done random bits and pieces here and there, but nothing amazing. Back garden, yeah, it's low maintenance, but it's still not been maintained, so it's still, it needs a bit of work doing to it. So at this point, I've got a bit of a feel, and because I've done this for decade plus now, in my head I've already got a number, I think, yeah, roughly it's going to cost about this. I'm not going to say it in case I'm wrong, um, but I, I would have a good indication now of, okay, yeah, probably this is how much we'd spend on it. But the next thing I would do personally is look in the area that it's actually in and then just do a search for other properties that are for sale and recently sold. So this is what it would throw up. And I always, I tend to look, try that again. I tend to use the map view so I can try and find properties that are geographically quite close. Because although, yes, you do want to compare apples with apples, so you want a three-bed semi compared with a three-bed semi, if that three-bed semi will here, you can see, I'm assuming, Richard, it's changed. Yeah. Yep, it's changed. Cool. Um, but you can see here there's a railway line down the middle of the screen. What's on one side of the tracks literally could be the wrong side of the tracks. If you're comparing, say, this property with that property, could be very different um, simply because of which side of the train tracks they're on. So the closer you can get them all together, the better. And so here's one I've done earlier type thing. I believe, if I'm right, yeah, that's the property that we're looking at um, that you've already seen. So you can look at one down there, directly comparable, right? looks similar, right sort of price. And so you just go through all of these ones probably in the nearest vicinity. You can see I've searched by three beds, houses, so I'm not getting two bed flats here to compare with. So I've kind of narrowed it down, the filter, so I'm not being overloaded with lots and lots of information. The other place, so what I'd probably do is just open up a few of these, but I already have done. Um, the next place I'd come is here, where I would then start looking through recently sold prices in the postcode area. Now this one, it says 100, but this is actually the property that's currently available, so I think that might be an anomaly. But we've got this one at 183, very similar, same bay window at the front, another one down there, 155. So I'm starting already 180 for a very similar one. I'm starting to get a feel for roughly the prices we might expect. And 183, I think this is the one that we've just seen that sold when? November 2016. So this is the first comp we're going to look at. And from the external, you can see it's very similar to our target property. So I tend to just then flick through a couple of the pictures to see generally what the interior um, level of spec is like. Now this all looks like it's in good condition. Um, probably not been decorated for a while, but generally in good nick. Um, so yeah, from this one you can see, it's hard to tell, but you can see they've got kind of new fittings for the light switches and plug sockets. That tends to be something I keep an eye out for, just to see, give you a bit of an indication, when were the electrics last done? Uh, same as, so this has got another extension, a bit like ours, this one looks a bit nicer, but generally speaking, I think that's probably a good summary of this property versus ours, it's just a bit nicer. Um, but certainly from a layout, from a floor plan, floor space type area, it's about the same. So I think it's a good comp. Um, I generally flick through all of them to see like for like, um, just to make sure there's nothing outstanding about this one that ours hasn't got. But I don't think this one has. And by don't think, I mean I've already checked it once, so don't worry. Um, it has got a bright pink room, which is always nice. So I'll then look at the next one along which 155, so a bit of a different price. You've got 183, 155, very similar from the outside again, so I'm guessing there's going to be something internally different. And yet, as you can see, this isn't as well done as the last one. Back garden, not as manicured as the other one, but still same sort of size uh, plot, so you're not 
we're not going to be losing out from having a tiny garden or anything like that. Kitchen, um, but yeah, you get a general feel that this is one that's not been looked after as well. Windows still look okay. You could see in the last one that they were all right as well. So just generally, this one feels a bit tired and purple, um, <laughs> and not a picture. So yeah, and this sold September 14, so it was a little bit f um, a while ago. So that's probably less of a good comparable for us, but it's still a very similar one. Now this is, well, was recently on the market. It's now sold subject to contract. So this is now we're starting to get into the actual comparables for as of today type thing. So that's good. So I'll have a quick scan through this one. Old fireplace, so it's probably not been done for a while. Uh, conservatory, again, fireplace. It's it's telling me that it's not been updated recently, so we don't necessarily have to, we could possibly get more for ours once it was done up in A1 condition. For some reason, the pictures aren't changing for me, so I guess that means we won't be looking at all of these. Whatever. This one, again, because we've looked on this, so we've checked all the ones that are locally, so I know all the ones that we're now reviewing are within sort of a quarter of a mile, half a mile at most, they're three bed houses, so they're very similar in size. This one I like internally. This is the sort of level of finish that we'd be looking at recreating in our property. So is so there any, is there any pink or purple, Damien? Uh, no pink or purple, I'm afraid. Mostly just white and neutral. It's a little bit boring, but eh, it works. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we could always put a purple room in if you'd like. Mm, does it affect our own value? Uh, always about the numbers. What yeah. about the creativity of property development, Richard? Mm, not so much. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, as long as it adds to the numbers. <laughs> so this one, as I say, I like it. I think we can replicate this. Um, it's, it's clean. It's straightforward. The fact it hasn't got... I mean, yeah, there's just nothing wrong with this. It's kind of technical this one, and neutral and modern, isn't it? Exactly. Very similar kitchen to the one that we put in. We tend to put the ones in that have handles on rather than the like recessed handles, but quite similar. Yeah, oven integrated, blah, blah, blah. So I feel like we could match this from a quality and a spec perspective. That's what I'd be looking at. Same with the bathroom. We'd be doing something very similar to this. The fact that this sold for 169 um, recently, that bodes well for us. And then there's just a couple of other ones. This slightly higher. This is offers over 180 now. So what what I'm basically thinking now is what makes this worth that much more? Internally, it's the pictures aren't great. They seem a little bit oversaturated, but it's nicely done. It's very family-ish. So this 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 I think this one's a little bit bigger than ours. It is deeper. Um, you can sort of check floor plan to see how it matches up. There's a garage with this one. The house doesn't have a garage. So you can maybe see why that one might be a little bit higher. And then this one, this is a slightly different design. Again, internally, it's in a good condition. So they have their own sarcophagus and mummy. That's nice. Um, <laughs> yeah, that threw me. Um, so, yeah, this one probably less so for a comparable just because it's a slightly different layout and design. The other ones, fortunately, um, were very similar, if not identical. Um, now I've lost all the front pictures. Yeah, they've got that same curved bay window that our target property has. So almost identical from a comparable point of view. So that's ideal. So having been through all of that, we then go across to our little calculator. And hopefully everyone can see this now. I now can. what we've done, excellent. What we've done is, this is the first page where we just put some details about the properties that we've looked at for comparable purposes. Yeah, so I just had to re-say that in my own mind to make sure it made sense as a word. Um, so we've gone through and said if it's sold subject contract, if it's actually sold, um, whether it's on the market still. If it's on the market, then we've knocked the price down a little bit just to sort of give a bit of leeway in as much as you might not get full asking price. So that's the only reason why you'd see the price and the valuation being different. And then there's just the links that make it easier for us to find them. But the average price then for this area, for this type of property, 170000 Now, 
we know sort of the GDV of it. We know what we can buy it for. So if you remember the two GDV or three VM. areas we said. Say again. GDV. GDV, oh, sorry, getting carried away. That's the gross development value, so basically how much we can sell it for. So if you remember the three areas we can make profits in property, you've got the buying, the doing the work, and the selling. At this point, we know the buying price of it. We've got a fairly good indication of the selling price of it, so the part that we're missing is the bit in the middle, and that's why we scoot across to this one, which is our schedule of worksheet. Now, this is... At this stage, it's very back of the envelope, so we would not expect this to be 100% accurate, but having done it for a decade plus, hundreds of properties, we've got a fairly good idea of what it's going to look like in real life. So all I'll be doing for this is looking through the pictures on Rightmove, flicking through them, and just taking a look at what I think needs doing. So just as a quick guide, the front door on the, on the picture, let's have a look at the picture if we can get it back up. That front door looks awful. That needs replacing. So we'd put that in our spreadsheet to just say, yeah, we should probably do something with the front door. And then same thing, driveway looked a bit dirty inside. Doubt we'd have to resurface it, but we'd probably have to spend a bit of money just making it look a bit nicer, give it that curb appeal. Same with the front and back garden. Probably going to spend quite a bit of money on that because it wasn't maintained particularly well. And then internally, just going through sort of line by line, looking at things. It's I guess it's almost assuming the worst in as much as this assumes we completely replace the central heating, all the plumbing, all the electric. We might not have to do that, but from our perspective, we'd rather be realistic and slightly pessimistic <laughs> with the works budget um, and be nicely, pleasantly surprised at the end where we don't spend all this. So as you can see, you can just, we just go through line by line and say, yeah, I think it needs that, 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 and that. The project management, if you're going to do it yourself, you need to account for your own time or if you're going to employ someone, then you need to pay them to do it. So that's just another line that we put in there. But this all spits out this big spreadsheet, which is massively zoomed in. So I hope everyone can read it well. Looks good to me. Excellent. So the purchase price, it was 100000 but it was actually guide price of 100000 So we know that that's going to go to um, an auction. So what we've done there, you... A lot of people will sometimes say, oh, when you go to an auction, they lower the guide price as low as possible to get everybody interested, and then actually the reserve set at 60, 70, 80% above that. It's just to get people over-interested and keen. I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to think now. Is it actually illegal? I don't think it is, but the RICS have basically said you can't set a guide price um, that is 10% plus or minus the reserve price. So if we know this property is guide price 100, the maximum the reserve is going to be is 110,000. So we've assumed we pay the 110. We might be lucky and get it for 90. We might be lucky and get it for less than that. There might not be a reserve price on it. We might get it for 100. But again, just being a little bit realistic, trying to wind the numbers back a bit, we've said 110 is purchase price. And then we just quickly go through the refurb from the previous Excel sheet. That comes out there, stamp duty, and because of the uh, 3% we assume that's going to get paid, legals, bits and bobs, contingency in there, just in case we have missed anything or if something crops up along the way, and then holding costs. Richard, do you want to talk about the holding costs? Because A, you haven't spoken for a while, but B, this is something you tend to look after a bit more than me during the projects. Yeah, sure. I was also going to mention the contingency. I think we budgeted about 15% in there on contingency, uh, something like that from memory. It's a bit less than that, but I think it's about 12, 12.5%, 12 something it? like that. Okay. Yeah, so the, that can be flexed depending on your uh, experience is what I was going to add to that point. But yeah, on, on holding costs, people often overlook this. And um, there are costs in owning a property which you're going to have to pay. So if you're going to do a mini development, this is just a mini refurb project, uh, you're going to have uh, some costs to incur. Uh, and there's been a lot of rule changes recently. Sta um, sorry, council tax being one of the biggest ones. So you're going to have to pay council tax even if the property's empty. Used to be the case that you could get away with six or 12 months with an empty property and not pay council tax. It's pretty much uh, nationwide now that you'll have to pay council tax, um, if not immediately, very soon after ownership. So there'll be council tax, there'll be some utilities to pay, there'll be some insurance to pay, um, just to hold the property. So the longer you hold it, the longer, the more it costs. So we put those assumptions in there. And then um, the financing costs. In this example, um, 
if you, you're probably going to show Damien or say that so we've assumed that whoever's buying this would use some form of short-term financing rather than pure, purely paying cash so um, part of the holding cost is is paying the interest on the uh, on the bridging finance uh, so that goes in there too and then obviously there'll be estate agent fees and legal fees when you come to sell it so that's how that just shy of 11,000 is kind of made up and a lot of people forget those costs or some of them especially the holding costs so uh, it can, as you can see, 1,800 pounds just to hold this property for nine months. It's quite a chunk, so you don't want to be underestimating there. Yep, yeah, absolutely. I think it's probably worth mentioning that this is a just a summary sheet of a much larger, and much more in-depth sheet that we use for our own analysis. So, and I've just put as an indication, the finance costs are assuming a 70% loan to valuation mortgage, um, probably bridging finance to be honest, costing 10% per annum. So that 6,125 effectively equates to the 75, 70% uh, of purchase price and the cost of holding it for those nine months. So that's where that number comes from. But in reality, we have a much more in-depth line-by-line calculation, but it's a bit boring. So we thought we'd just show the summary sheet for it. So just going on, the GDV, as you all remember, gross development value, is the valuation of the property once we've done the work and got it up into A1 pretty condition. Now at the moment that's looking at the 17856 which is a 55% uplift so if you remember Richard's 40% as sort of a, a KPI minimum for us that's exceeding that so happy days we're happy with that one and that's going to result in a net profit of 15,379. Now because I am a bit of a northerner and therefore a little bit cynical I Given the comparables we've looked at, I think 170 is probably about right and realistic for this one. So there was one on the market that was quite similar that sold for um, the 180 mark. There was another one on the market that sold for 170. So I think I think we're about right with this. And given that we're nine months away from putting it on the market, I think we could probably achieve this. But I'd probably be tempted for our own purposes to lower that as an end valuation just to give us a bit more... Um, potential upside as opposed to potential downside when we actually come to sell it. So I'm thinking, what do you reckon, 167, 165? Well, yeah, yes. <laughs> yes, okay, thanks for that. Yes. 165, well, yeah, there's a couple of points. One is you might end up paying a little bit more than 110 on this property because other people look at comps as well. Um, you might end up paying more than 10% interest on a, on a bridge uh, for this because it's kind of classed as a heavy refurb I won't bore you with the technicalities but if it's above 15 percent of the purchase price that'd be classed as heavy refurb therefore it's more expensive for some reason uh, and and then the purchase and then valuation so you could flex any one of those or all of them so if you put in 165 you probably take account of some of the other things I've just been talking about maybe well let's go for that then so okay 165 that takes us to 9593 pounds profit which still isn't bad for nine months work. Um, the cash required, so bearing in mind that we've talked about getting finance, bridging finance for the original purchase price, and then paying out all of the other costs in cash, you can see over here that the cash required to get involved in this deal and go all the way through is just shy of 80,000, 78,407. And with the profit being that, the return investment is looking at 12.2%. Now, if we annualize that, it's looking at 16.3, which I think if anybody can find 16.3% in a bank account, let me know. Um, so it's a pretty good return. It's a good solid return. Relatively low risk. I'm not going to say it's actually low risk, but um, it's buying a property. You've got yourself a physical asset. So I think the return there is pretty solid. I'd be happy with that. And this is the sort of deal I did several times and still do now and would sort of make the call at the end whether I sold it to make the realize the nine and a half thousand pound profit or refinance it hold it and rent it out and we can then look at the return investment of the cash left in when you rent it out long term and refinance it at a better rate than 10 percent so this is very much sort of bread and butter stuff for me I've done it for years I think Richard you've done similar sort of deals yeah. um, along the way so I think I think that's a fair representation of the process we go through, how we come up with the numbers and how we kind of assess it at the end once we've got this summary sheet 
and it tells us exactly how much profit we, sh we can expect to make, what the return is on how efficiently we're using the money that's invested in it, um, and it gives us this. Have I missed anything? Is there anything to add? Well, no. I mean, I think we've talked it through. I mean, it's, an, it's just one example. It happens to be one that probably works as well. So um, we could have dismissed this at any point sooner, couldn't we? We could have said, you know, it's yeah, the comps don't sustain uh, the 40% uplift, so we ki we kill it. So um, I think we just deliberately picked one that would go through uh, the process and would come out with a good result. So uh, it would have been a short webinar otherwise. <laughs> it would have been indeed. We obviously wanted to show people the end-to-end -end process. So we kind of talked about some of the things to watch out for. Maybe you could end up paying a little bit more in the auction room. Maybe uh, you couldn't get the same finance rate. Maybe you couldn't sell it for quite that much. Although there was a very good comp, I think, actually. Very close, yeah. very similar to what we would get. So I'm very confident in that part of it. Um, yeah, and I say this one is assuming uh, using bridging. You could just pay cash. Um, I haven't kind of worked out the numbers, but it probably costs you about 140 to 100, no, about 155 thousand ish, I should think, to do it cash. So um, yeah, a very nice, tidy deal with a bit of wriggle room, and we like that. Yep. Okie dokie. Well, now if I can seamlessly do it, hand back across. So we've just looked at a deal. So what is the next steps indeed what are they share it with me and I'll probably take it through so essentially what we've done now is we've kind of whistled uh, whistled yeah we've whistled <laughs> through a little bit of the free component parts so the treasure map where to find the hidden treasure where to find the deals so um, you know we talked about finding you know the the trigger points what's personal to you accessible to you what's good in the area in terms of supply and demand if you remember those sort of things we talked about your added value strategy whether it's to flip or trade it or buy to sell all, all the same thing, basically buying and selling property, or whether it's just buy to, buy to let, um, maybe doing a refurbishment or maybe not. Um, and then BRR, which is buy, refurbish, refinance. So it is effectively taking the last project. The last project we just looked at, you could do all three, essentially. You could either uh, buy it, do it up and sell it on. You could buy it, do it up and just rent it out, or you could buy it, refurbish it and rent it out. Uh, and refinance it and rent it out is what I meant. So lots of things you could do there, but have your strategy. And then of course the uh, deal or no deal evaluation spreadsheet, which is a nice one with the green highlights, etc., that uh, Damien just shared. So that's what we've covered in terms of um, our results. So these are actual results. We did do this. Uh, we, we evaluated it. We perhaps had a little cry, <laughs> but they are real world results. So um, essentially, 50 properties are screened at a top level. Uh, we don't personally do that. We ask somebody else to do that for us, but that's what they do. Um, of, of those 50, between five and 10 pass those rules or those sniff test rules that we kind of gave. 95% of asking price, 80% funds recycling if you follow in the BRR strategy, and 40% uplift in value um, capability. So roughly five to 10 get that far, and the rest are you know, effectively overlooked. Then out of those five to 10, one or two will pass the de desktop evaluation uh, process that uh, Damien's just walked through. So that's basically doing the comparables, looking at the works involved and doing a bit more in-depth analysis um, and potentially speaking to a local agent and that kind of thing. So we then proceed to view and offer. And I guess the result of that all in is around about one in 50 of our property searches leads to an offer. And that takes round about 30 hours a week of desktop research activity. So just a bit of a marker there for you, but just what to expect really. So you can flex your time, but you know you can see the level of work that's involved to do this sort of self-sourcing activity. But I guess, is there an easier way? Well, I think actually there might be more than one easier way. There in fact are maybe three. So the first easier way is to uh, self-source. Uh, and, and that's actually what, what we've just been talking about. So um, using the system, uh, maybe the system we're using is a little bit more sophisticated. It's not super sophisticated, but it's more sophisticated than, you know, just trompsing around or traipsing around estate agents, um, going a look at potential projects and uh, the one in 50 type of ratio, 30 hours a week type of time. And uh, of course you won't get every offer accepted either. So that's what you could expect if you self-source. 
The other alternative potentially is to outsource. Now you can outsource in a couple of ways and you can outsource uh, part or all of the process. One way, and it's partly what we do, you can recruit and pay someone to do some of the work or all of the work for you. Um, one of the options is to have a staff member or a contractor. Uh, and of course, that's usually based on time, uh, hourly rates and time spent. So we actually have onshore staff. We pay them around about 10 pounds an hour. Uh, so it's around about 1,200 pounds a month. We also have uh, an offshore researcher who's uh, doing the front end stuff. Do you remember the first spreadsheet Damien showed with 1600 odd, was it? I think it was something like that. 1800, I think 18, it was. 1800, has gone up already. <laughs> 1800 odd uh, opportunities. And uh, we pay $600 a month, US dollars that is, uh, $5 an hour. You can get it slightly less, but that sort of figure. So that's the sort of contractor route. Alternatively, you could essentially pay a deal sourcer and all a deal sourcer does is take exactly this process we've just been outlining, whether they do it themselves, whether they have on or offshore people, um, but, and they basically package it up to get to a formal offer. Someone will pay 110,000 for that property like the last one, but if you want it, it's gonna cost between three and 5,000 pounds or two to three, uh, sorry, two to three percent of the deal. So there's a price to pay is really what I'm talking about. The price is either time, uh, cost of paying someone, or the post cost of a deal saucer and the figures are there for you to see. But how does a pound sound? Pound sounds pretty good, doesn't it, Damien? Sounds sound. Sounds good. So we're going to talk about maybe for just one pound, why don't you just let us help you find the, your next deal for the next month with our deal tip service. And I know what the question is on your lips. What is... What's the deal tip service, Richard? <laughs> exactly. What's the deal tip service? So why don't we just share that now? So. The deal tip service from Real World Property is uh, it's ready-made deal tips. So these are somewhere in between um, you doing it and a source of doing it. So we've done uh, an analysis uh, exactly the same as what Damien's walked through and we, we package that up and we deliver it in an email straight to your e e uh, email inbox every single week. So they're pre-screened, they could be on the market, so they could be listed on Rightmove, in other words, and similar portals, or they could be off market, so they could actually come from deal sources. Uh, and the logic in that is that they may still stack up if they come from a deal sourcer. Uh, a bit of a caveat there, not all deal sourcer deals stack up. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's a shock, isn't it? <laughs> I feel like I've been lied to. <laughs> <laughs> so we do take deals from uh, deal sources, but not all of them. Um, and our deal tip service basically would save you around about 30 hours a week in time or up to or even more than a five, uh, 5,000 pounds per deal if you use a deal source route. Uh, they tend to be between 7 and 15%, sometimes more. You actually saw the one we just showed you. That would be a deal tip. Uh, we would probably package it up at less than 15% return on investment, but you could see quite easily there is a way to get it higher. You know, if you could buy it for less, if you could spend less on the works, and if you could sell it for more, you could actually improve the return. But we're a little bit, uh, to coin Damien's phrase, miserable. So um, <laughs> yeah, we're a bit pessimistic, or we're real world. So 7 to 15% return on investment. It's, I think as well, just on that point, while you're picking on me for being real worldy, um, what when I'm pricing up a job for things like that, I don't necessarily assume that either you can do the works yourself or you have a massive team of contractors on staff to do these things. So I think, I can't remember now, but I think it was about 30 grand to do that particular property. In reality, if I was, back in the day, if I was doing that and I was getting quite involved with it and using my team of people, I probably could have done it for closer to 20. Um, nowadays, probably if it would be more like 25 with an element of outsourcing bits and bobs of it. So I think there is room for that to come down. So as Richard said, there are, there are ways to get that ROI percentage much higher if you're willing to do some of the work. And I know some people that are looking for deals like these that maybe do just want one or two a year, actually want to get involved themselves and do bits and pieces of the, the job, whether it's just the project management side of it or being on site managing people, that in itself can save you thousands on a project like that one. Okay, excellent. And um, these projects have all undertaken detailed research, as you can probably see, and what we call our four eyes quality check. And it's not an insult before Damien jumps in. It's not an insult. <laughs> it just means that both Damien and I, with our two eyes both each. Both wear glasses. Uh, no, I've both looked at the deal. And uh, sometimes we agree with each other, and then it makes the grade. Uh, if we don't agree with each other, it doesn't. 
uh, and there's projects for you to go and manage yourself and there's no strings attached so that's why it's a deal tip service so we say here it is go now go and negotiate this yourself uh, manage it yourself and sell it yourself so no strings attached you don't have to work with us but we're here if you need us so moving on the um, how much is it worth well we talked about if you were to sell if you were to use this same process and self source we've told you how to do it 30 hours of your time uh, if you estimate 25 pounds an hour uh, you can flex that number uh, you might be worth a lot more than that um, that's 3250 pounds a month equivalent time equivalent you could save you could delegate it so you could pay a part-time contractor just like we do we pay 1200 pounds a month for an onshore that means a UK based con contractor or you could uh, have a combination of them and an offshore uh, contractor we pay someone overseas six hundred dollars a month on a part-time basis so there you go the a deal source is going to charge around about five thousand pounds for a deal uh, it could be slightly higher could be slightly less um, but um, there you go five thousand pounds and you can see how that number is justified to be honest um, so I'm not against deal sources uh, the average ROI um, about 10% so we talked about between 7 and 15 if you remember so if we take an average of say 10 10% ROI if you've got a hundred thousand pounds the example we just showed you I think required about 80 so you can just flex the numbers a little bit but it's uh, for every hundred thousand pounds that's ten thousand pounds so there's quite a lot of uh, upside quite a lot of saving by using this sort of service and then what you can do is as I mentioned try us now and you can try it for a pound just one pound you'll see details uh, popping up all over the place they'll get, tell you how to get involved and there'll be a link in a second so you can go in afterwards but uh, just one pound give it a try for the next 30 days and see the sorts of deals that come out see if it's for you so it's fairly low risk is what I'm saying and of course there's bonuses there's a bonus we want to encourage people to take action and take action fairly quickly so people who sign up within the next 72 hours or three days if you prefer they can have a copy of the deal evaluation spreadsheet which Damien was working through so uh, that's worth about 50 pounds uh, we'll, we'll pass that over gratis and uh, the full list you remember we talked about the top six ways to force appreciation in property well we'll share the top 10 uh, ways how, how to do that with a little bit more of explanation so there you go bit of an incentive for the people who are going to sign up over the next uh, three days or 72 hours so why don't you sit back uh, sit back <laughs> sit back relax and let us find your next deal over the next 30 days and if you don't like the service just cancel it and you get to keep the bonuses as well and the next one yep so what is it we're offering just a recap ready-made profitable deals delivered straight to your inbox each and every week it's going to save you countless hours in time and or cost whether you do it yourself whether you pay someone or whether you have a deal sourcer between 7 to 15% return on investment on assessed potential profit in the real world. I think you can see that by now. It's suitable for multiple property uh, projects such as buy to let, buy to sell, buy refurbish refinance. They're thoroughly screened, they're researched and they're quality checked. So go ahead. There's no strings attached. To, why not? Just sign up now. So um, the doors are open briefly for the next 25 subscriber intake only. We want to kind of keep a bit of a limit on the number of people who are having access to the deals so that we can provide quality service and that kind of thing so we'll open the doors to the next 25 people to sign up to the service so give it a go just one pound uh, whilst we still got some places left so there you go uh, hopefully that's been useful um, we've covered quite a lot of ground over the course of the training uh, if you want to find out a little bit more about the deal tip service there's a, there's a URL or web link there so it's realworldpropertytraining.com slash deal dash tips dash service and just a quick thing before we kind of wrap up fully um, as always on our training uh, products and, and services we make a, a donation to uh, good causes we've got a help fund so 5% of any subscription fees are donated to that good cause so you can read about it there but uh, it's just part of our giving back that we have there and an email address contact us if you've got any additional questions but I think uh, from writing thinking Damien that probably brings the training to a bit of a close uh, I think it does. It does. Is there anything you wanted to add particularly? Not really, other than give it a go. What have you got to lose for a pound? If there's a potential 10 grand profit in it from a deal, which, okay, realistically is going to take 6 to 12 months. We, we tend to use 9 months for these type of projects, but 
it pretty much pays for itself in a pretty short time, doesn't it? <laughs> Certainly a pound it does. So anyway, um, you, we've given you the tools really to go off and do it yourself. So by all means, try that. Uh, and once you realize how hard it really is, um, well, hopefully the doors will still be open. <laughs> but uh, give it a go. One pound, the uh, real world property deal tip service. But thanks very much for listening today. Really appreciate it. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye for now. Cheers.